I thought I'd just like to take a minute to talk about uh, the development of Vanguard and the development of indexing at Vanguard, uh, partly based on Gus's remarks. And first, let me say that there is an, in that Wall Street Journal article, it was so nice, championed the long term. I love that. There was a, a comment by Holman Jenkins that uh, an industry graybeard told me that I would ruin the industry if I started a mutual company. This was not a graybeard. Uh, this was a man named John B. Lovelace, or John Lovelace, his father, John B. Lovelace, was the founder of the American Fund Group out in Los Angeles, and John was the head of it, and he was a year ahead of me at Princeton, so calling him a gray beard is not exactly accurate, <laughs> but he was an important factor in the industry, not a big participant, but uh, that was has always been a very well thought of group, and he was a great guy, and he had to see me when I was out in their offices. I visited around a lot in those days. And when I was out in his office, he said, I have to see you. And I said, well, I can't do it uh, now. I've got a lot of meetings with your people. And then I can't do it tonight because I've got a dinner engagement. And I'll be leaving tomorrow morning on the 7 o'clock uh, plane to Philadelphia. And so if you want to meet me at the airport, I'll meet you in the diner at 6 o'clock. So I went to the diner at 6 o'clock in all those all covered little stools kind of thing, uh, like linoleum or something, and in there was John. And after a brief, very brief introduction, he said, um, I've heard that you're going to try and start a mutual company. And I said, that's true. I don't know if it's going to work or not. We're still in the middle of no man's land with the board of directors in the summer of 1974, and no one knew how it was going to come out. And I said, yes, that's what I'm planning. And he said, if you do that, you will destroy this industry. But this is not a gray beard. This is a guy about my age, and certainly with my Princeton heritage. And he was very, very foresighted. And we did not destroy the industry. But if he just added, you'll destroy this industry as we now know it, that is exactly what is happening now. And the reason for that goes through a phrase I haven't used yet today, but I I use it, usually use it about 10 times a day when I'm trying to explain to an outsider what we're all about. And that is we started with the structure, the mutual structure, and then developed from that structure, I have a speech called Strategy Follows Structure, uh, a low-cost strategy, the obvious thing to do if you have that structure, of which the highlight would, of course, be an index fund. Uh, so that was strategy and structure together. And... Uh, it's, it's amazing that um, it has worked this way. And I thought I'd just talk a little bit about the development of our index business. Um, first of all, because of the point I'm trying to make is every single thing I'm about to tell you was intuitive. We had not a single formula. I didn't understand most formulas. I can probably read half of half of the articles in the Financial Analyst Journal and the Journal of Portfolio Management. Or did I write half of them? I don't know, but something like that. And uh, it was all intuitive. And starting with Vanguard Index Trust, first index investment trust, as it was called, in the 1975 when it was formed, um, I did a crude comparison of the, uh, the companies and the, the mutual funds in the industry there were about 60 is all. They were all pretty much large cap, blue chip kind of funds, very, very similar. And uh, I compared them for 35 years for the S&P 500. You saw that, that slide in my talk. And they, the, the index won by 1.6%, I think was the number. And 35 years later, or maybe it was 38 years later, that is to say a couple of years ago, I decided it would be interesting to see the correlation of that um, that group of mutual funds, in terms of their performance, how much was explained by the S&P 500. So I put Knight Nolan to work, and it turned out to be 97. In other words, if I produced that number, I would have been really confident. But this was just done intuitively without any of that. Then I decided that the S&P 500 would be the, the preferred index. I hadn't really heard of much else. I knew the Dow Jones was a terrible index, and uh, the Wilshire wasn't even developed by then. Um, total market index. So we did start with the S&P 500. And I thought, you know, it might be a good idea for purists. We thought about changing 
the um, uh, structure of the fund to be the total stock market. That made more sense, really. But no one had ever heard of the total stock market index. So we, in 1985, we created the Extended Market Index Fund, the Completion Fund. That's now our small, mid-cap and small-cap fund, and it's been very, very successful. But the original idea was the intuitive idea that you want to go out and get the rest of the market. Statistical studies about that? None. I didn't even know what the composition was. At that point, we brought Gus Sauter in because we now had two index funds, and uh, we went on from there. In, uh, we started a bond fund, I think in 86. That was not Gus's part of it. And then in 89, I think, don't hold me to these dates. I didn't look them up. But around 89, we started an international fund. And I had the, the intuition that um, IFA, Europe, Australia, and Far East, Japan was terribly overpriced. It was half the world's market cap at that time. So I thought it would be a good idea to separate and have a European portfolio and a Pacific portfolio. Strictly intuitive. No data. The fact the Japanese market soon collapsed <laughs> kind of indicated keeping them apart. And that's where that came from. Small cap fund, small cap index fund in 1990, roughly, came when the manager for the small cap index that we had, small cap managed fund that we had, came into my office. And I was telling him what a terrible job he'd done, and uh, which he had. And he said, and this is the first time I'd really thought about it. I said, you know, I think we're going to convert this into, into a small cap index fund. And we did. I wasn't sure exactly how the small cap index worked, but it's worked okay. It's basically the best small cap index around, although I don't like its concept particularly, but that's another one. Then uh, we started those admiral funds, for original admiral funds for long, short, and intermediate term treasuries on, based on the way we ran our municipal bonds, have the shareholder choose between uh, yield and volatility. Then we started, this is a curious one, the growth and value funds. I had said probably in 1990, the development of our growth and value funds is going to be the formation of growth and our growth and value funds will come as soon as we have a growth and value index. I didn't know what would be in the index. How would I know that? So Standard and Poor's announced they were splitting the 500 into growth and value. So we started the fund, totally in, on intuition, on the basis that those two um, growth and value would be the same in the future. I warned people about switching on them, and, and there were. Turns out from then to now, 93, I think that was, um, growth and value had the same 9% return. It happens that Morningstar says that these two funds, growth and value, are the oldest and largest factor funds in the industry. So I will take credit for building the factor fund industry, but I don't want any credit for it because I don't believe in that. I started them for a very different reason. And, and I want to understand that you can have formulas and formulas and formulas but if they don't comport with common sense, you don't want to have anything to do with them. You can prove anything with data. I've done my share. And so that's a little bit about the development. We also tried quantitative, hire a quantitative manager, John Gorniak by name, to run Vanguard quantitative portfolios. And it seems so easy. You know, there's the S&P 500. Just get rid of the five worst stocks or the three worst stocks, and all of a sudden you'll do well. Seems easy. It wasn't easy. And he barely outperformed the S&P 500 after, after taxes, I think, maybe underperformed with that quantitative portfolio. And I honestly can't remember if we still have a quantitative portfolio or not. Um, but uh, it didn't work. Uh, when we had a managed fund, I picked the new managers by intuition. When we had uh, Windsor 2, which I was assured would never do as well as Windsor, picked the manager, Farrell Hanley. And uh, down in Dallas, and uh, in fact, Windsor too has done a little bit better than Windsor, although they correlate very, very highly as they were supposed to. Prime Cap, I like the way these guys look. They worked for American Funds, they had a lot of experience, and they did a great job on that. So I want to get em emphasized that we can look at formulas until hell freezes over, but use your head too, <laughs> and it's just to me common sense.